the 5th, 1990, an RAF station Swindeby has opened its gates to the general public, inviting their participation in the celebrations marking the airfield's 50th anniversary. For it was on this day in 1940 that the station began a life that was to see constant changes in both its wartime and peacetime roles, making it an almost impossible task to even imagine how many thousands of airmen, airwomen, and civilian workers had passed through here while serving their country. Certainly some of those present today will have returned to see again the localities in which they once worked and to relate their reminiscences to the current station commander, Group Captain Williams. On not many occasions in the past has the airfield enjoyed a carnival atmosphere like that of today's, with shops, stalls, exhibitions and demonstrations of all kinds being provided for the visitor many of whom will have been attracted by the promise of a flying display to round off the day's entertainment. Children aren't forgotten about either, for they have their own area set aside for very different kinds of flying. Many light aircraft, both service and privately owned, await their turn to join the fly past, taking instructions not from the wartime control tower, but from its peacetime replacement, that is surprisingly under civilian management, a radical change from days gone by. the threat of impending war in 1939, a large tract of Lincolnshire farmland was earmarked for development as the future RAF Swindeby. The plans for its construction being placed into the hands of civil engineers John Lang and company. But before an airfield of such proportions could be constructed, after the setting up of temporary offices and accommodation for the workers, several farms would disappear allowing the plan changes to take their place on the ground. The first service units to be selected were two Polish squadrons from Bramcote, and on completion they and their fairy battles would be moved in. At the northernmost point of the diamond-shaped base, Retired hotelier Des Underwood recalls his childhood memories of finding himself living close to a proposed new airfield. As a child of nine, then coming on to ten then, um, and living and w going to a village school, of course we didn't know what an airdrome was. Certainly I'd never seen an, aer an airplane uh, except one on Scampton when I was seven years of age. That's the only airplane I'd ever seen on the ground. So we still had no concept of what an aerodrome might mean to us or, of course, to the wider community. Greengate Farm was the wartime home of schoolgirl Gwen Morell. I remember all the farms, the three, about three farms, several little cottages and also a garage. 
and uh, they were all bulldozed down and also the woods yes and uh, all that took some months to do and then uh, Langs came in, the contractors, and put all the drains to drain the camp. It took a mere ten months to convert woods and farmland into a station capable of receiving aircraft, whose arrival is also well remembered. I remember the very first plane arriving, great excitement, it was great excitement. It was all deadly quiet one Sunday afternoon and uh, we heard something in the sky and so that was very unusual at that time and so out we went and to our amazement this little fairy battle was bobbing down along the grass no runways were made at that time and uh, oh that was great excitement so I remember the very first plane to land. Thirteen battles of number 300 squadron arrived that August day in 1940 followed by 17 of 301 six days later. And by September the 14th, three from each unit had attacked Boulogne Harbour, thereby establishing Swindeby as an RAF bomber base. Retaliation from the Luftwaffe came just one month later, causing little damage. I was in bed at the time, and uh, I think there was a stick of something like eight bombs, which probably wouldn't be very big bombs. I, I don't know, I think somebody said they were 250 pounders. But the hell of a racket which these bombs made fr certainly frightened me to death. And I was in the bedroom at the time, it was at night time, probably latish evening. Um, and I subsequently heard that um, very little damage was done and nobody had been killed, apart from one person, I think, being injured. The first Wellington aircraft arrived to replace the battles on October the 17th, completing the task by November the 10th. And on December the 22nd carried out their first operation, Antwerp being attacked without loss. But a week later, on returning from the same target, the airfield witnessed its first Wellington casualty. The apprehension that I had um, about the people serving in the services uh, wasn't helped any by uh, later on when other aircraft came, came, crashes arrived where people would be limping back from a raid in Germany, a bomber raid, where they'd been damaged and would finish up in one of the fields round about. In January 1941, the King and Queen honoured the station with a visit followed in July by General Sikorsky and Air Chief Marshal Sir Charles Portal, when the Polish standard was presented to 300 Squadron, after being smuggled out of the homeland. The final Polish raid from Swindeby came on July the 17th, 1941, when Cologne was added to a list of targets that had included Berlin, Mannheim, Bremen and Wilhelmshaven. Followed the day after by both the Pomorski and Mazovici squadrons being posted to nearby Hemswell. 455 was the first Australian squadron to serve with the RAF and was posted to Swindeby in June 41, followed by number 50 RAF squadron in July. Both flew Hamdens and were given Cologne and Frankfurt as their first targets before flying was halted in November for the construction of the first concrete runways which took five months to complete. 50 Squadron returned from Skellingthorpe on June the 20th, 1942, flying the new but short-lived Manchesters that operated for the last time against Bremen on June the 25th. The mighty Lancasters that replaced them made their final attack from Swindeby on October the 14th. So, bringing to an end a bombing contribution that had cost 103 aircraft whilst earning for Swindeby and its satellites, Wigsley, Winthorpe and Skellingthorpe, no fewer than 82 decorations for valour, including one Victoria Cross. Swindeby's remaining wartime roles were many and varied, with aircraft types and duties much too numerous to record. 
Not until 1946 was some permanence established by the arrival of what would be the station's longest serving arm, number 17 operational training unit. Later to be renamed number 201 advanced flying school. I arrived at Swinderby at the beginning of September 1947, straight from the electrical training school at Melksham and Wiltshire, by which time 201 AFS had been well established. A long-held fear that my national service might not bring me in contact with aircraft was quickly dispelled, for the first sight on leaving the bus was an airfield well stocked with Wellington bombers. All personnel were housed in comfortable H-blocks, named after VC decorated wartime heroes. My first Windby home, remembering squadron leader John Nettleton, and close by were the station's sick quarters and hospital, from whose care I would later benefit. Other essential services were also conveniently grouped together with the airmen's mess central to all of the eight living quarters in a complex that also housed the station cinema, which doubled on occasions as a lecture theatre, often dealing with matters of health and hygiene. Next door, the NAFI provided refreshments on a nightly basis and regular fortnightly dancing to number 21 group dance band. Another comforting night spot was the Salvation Army Canteen and Shop, ably managed by Captain Walter Portis, who preferred us to borrow his radiogram rather than play our records of the day on the premises. Gifts from home were always most welcome, so the receipt of a parcel chit would hurry other ranks to the station post office while sergeants, flight sergeants and warrant officers had a more personal service provided for them within their own detached quarters beyond the sports field. As you would expect, the officer's mess allowed even better comforts for its members, and like many other sections on the camp, provided employment too for quite a number of civilians living nearby. Yes, eventually there wasn't many jobs about for young people at a, a lonely place like that. And so when the camp got started, they, uh, I went to work as a seamstress in the uh, tailor shop. And they used to have clothing parades and uh, the tailor would go and fit the airmen and come back and we'd alter all the uniforms to fit them. Reporting to the technical site for the first time was a little daunting, for our electrical school training had yet to be tested, and whatever tasks to be set upon us by whoever was in charge of the section were yet to be revealed, understood, and then accomplished. But no doubt those that had been here before us would provide the necessary guidance. Having had experience of batteries at RAF Houston, I was sent to assist Polish Sergeant Bronik Nidzilek in Swinderby's battery room, initially during the day until proved capable of my own nighttime management. Every battery was identified by number and type with its condition on receipt and issue entered in a record book. Batteries were required for aircraft starting trolleys, a wide variety of road vehicles and ground equipment but it was those used on aircraft that received the closest attention. Two and a half miles from the airfield, Swinderby's railway station accommodated one of the largest wartime bomb dumps in the area. But by the late 40s, the principal reason for the RAF coming to the village was the plough in, where visiting airmen would suitably condition themselves before attending the village hall dances, where contact with local girls could be made. Nearer to the camp, the comfortable halfway house hotel 
would have provided visiting airwomen with their happy and lasting memories too. When I arrived at Swindeby, it was completely different to anything I'd ever done before. Um, I enjoyed station life. I enjoyed particularly uh, working in the sergeant's mess. I found that it was interesting and I was in the office there. I greeted the crews when they came in and they changed every six weeks. So there was always somebody new, something going on. We had a Christmas party there at one time for all the children of the village, which we organized. That went down very well indeed. We had one crash, if I can remember, while we were there. And uh, that wasn't a very happy day. I had to greet uh, the relatives of the, the people that were killed. And uh, I remember that quite vividly. Another thing that I do remember is that I had my 21st birthday at Swindeby. Seems a long time ago now. It was held at the Naffy. I think there was about 28 people there. And uh, certainly I enjoyed that. I worked for a while in the cinema, which I enjoyed very much. And the officer in charge then was Jeff Dubber, whom I remember very well. And uh, that was very happy as well. We had a good crowd up there. And all in all, I had a very enjoyable time there until I finally was demobbed and went up home to Scotland. From the battery room, I moved on to aircraft maintenance, advancing from pre-flight and daily inspections through to minor and eventually majors which required some in-flight calibrations. And later on, the early morning task of servicing the three flight simulator link trainers was also added to my workload. On the glass top desk, dual instruments indicated to the instructor the orientation of each pupil pilot's aircraft. And below the glass, an area map was tracked by a crab, leaving behind a telltale ink trace used to record pilot accuracy. David Guthrie was one of those trainees. I remember especially, it was a great surprise, I was a newly commissioned pilot officer. As I walked up to the officer's mess, I think everybody must have been going just to have lunch or going back, but anyway, I was absolutely astonished when people started saluting me, which was an experience I'd never had before. And by the time I got to the mess, my arm was quite tired, I must say. Swindby was a very happy station, as I remember it. Um, you see it now, and the trees have all grown up round the station headquarters. And when I was there, they were just quite small, and they hadn't been in, in position for very long. There were lots and lots of students there, and also um, a very happy bunch of flying instructors. And they used to come down to Newark quite a bit. And I had, in fact, seen them around the town before I'd actually been posted into Swindeby. The station commander at the time was Group Captain Bax, and the commander of the um, of the advanced flying school was um, Wing Commander Akins, as I recall, and he was quite an interested in motorsport and used to have his own little racing car, which he would trot out from time to time. One of the first things we had to do was um, learn all the emergency procedures, and there was an aircraft in one of the hangars which we used to, in, in which we used to do sort of parachute drills and evacuation drills, all that sort of thing. And also um, carry out things like blindfold cockpit drills, um, all of which was part of the course before you were allowed near a proper airplane. The grey block was a little smaller than the other seven, and until March 1948, was home to the station's WAFs. But by the 15th, 
They had been rehoused so that all electricians and instrument mechanics could be located under one roof. And here I would meet my new roommates. Working and living together didn't create any real problems. In fact, it was usual to be off camp with the same people at weekends. Unfortunately, there was always someone able to lend you a bob or two until payday, instead of having to remain in an empty billet, as comfortable as it was. Basingham's Black Swan was a firm favorite with many of us. Just half an hour's walk to reach it, followed by a drink and a game of darts or dominoes, provided a pleasant evening out. And across the road, fish and chips would complete the night's pleasures. The village's other attraction was a women's land army hostel, or rather the girls who lived in it, for they too often provided companionship and even romance for Swindaby's airmen. The loneliest job on the airfield could be maintaining runway lighting, yet it pleased some who were faced with this task. Okay, I remember going to Swindaby after um, quite a gruelling 12 weeks at Malksham, if I remember rightly, because not being an electrician, I was among a lot of electricians who knew what they were on about and I didn't. I struggled at times. So when I went to Swindaby, I was a little bit worried because I thought if I get put on the aircraft, you know, I hope I know what I'm doing. It's a bit of a responsibility, looking after aircraft engines and various things and whatnot. Anyway, they put me on the runway lighting, and that really pleased me because it was a lovely summer. One of the one of the hazards was when they cut the grass. The tractor used to hook hooked the cables up, didn't they? And they would come back in with a trail of lights behind them. Well, one or two. So that was quite a big job going out, fixing fixing the cables and sorting the lights. I had never, never been up flying. And I hadn't really thought about wanting to go up. One morning, Cliff Steenson came along and said, do you fancy flight? He said, I'm going up and test flight. I can organize it for you. Sure. Sure, great. So got rigged up with parachutes and away we went on this Wellington. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. Went over the scene, you know, saw Lincoln Cathedral from the air. Cliff was in the co-pilot seat. I was stood back in the Astrodome. Of course, it was a little bit worrying when I saw one of the engines feathered and the other one flying on one engine. Next morning, Cliff came white faced and told me that the uh, same plane had crashed on cross country that night, killing the crew, three crew, which was very upsetting for the sake of the three crew, not so much ourselves. Um, so that was my one and only flight. Swindaby's aircraft were divided into two sections, the FMAs of A flight and the FMBs of B both success rates being measured in hours flown by their respective trainee pilots and navigators. Interruptions of flying schedules due to bad weather were later balanced by continuous working periods of 21 days, followed by a long weekend off. For those who chose to stay on camp, the station cinema was always worth a visit or you could make your own pictures in the photographic club that utilized the old gas cleansing station. Swimming was popular in the best of gravel pits with a little play acting thrown in too. Or you could enjoy a more polished performance by the gang show on the cinema stage. To allow air crew their own recreation area, the cinema above the airman's mess had to be moved to the other end of Green Lane remaining under the same staff, managed by Jeff Dubber. I was stationed at uh, Swindaby after a successful career in the Royal Air Force flying four-engine bombers. And um, 
it was a touch and go as to whether I was going to um, stay in the service or come out. But the Air Ministry couldn't make their minds up. So as I was busy running the cinema part-time at Swindeby, I um, elected uh, to become a cinema manager for, for the cinema at Swindeby on the same salary as, um, as I was getting as a flying officer. The cinema was above the airman's mess and seated approximately 300 and probably 325, somewhere around there anyway. And it was quite a big cinema. And we had two shows per night and a, a single performance for kids on uh, Saturday. In 1946, uh, uh, Air Ministry decided they wanted our cinema to uh, to convert into an aircrew mess as a new um, item. Uh, in which case, we had to chase around to find out a suitable site for a cinema. About half a mile away, there was a, a redundant, derelict, misnotted site, and uh, we were told we could have that. Ably assisted by Dickie Dyson and Doug Todd, Jeff was later rewarded for his services by an invitation to a London Royal Command film performance in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen. With growing unrest in Europe by mid-1948, the RAF found itself short of radar mechanics for the impending Berlin airlift. So an electrical to radar conversion course was held at Swindeby, to which I was sent along with those chosen from a number of other RAF stations. And although the knowledge gained in the Nissen Hut classrooms was never put into practice, it did eventually prove useful when, along with my good friend Red Jackson, was allowed to continue private studies on day release at Lincoln Technical College until we were both returned back to civilian life in early 1949. AFS, with its new varsity aircraft, survived until June 1954. But in the following ten years, many other changes took place until Swindeby finally became the RAF's principal school of recruit training. Many attempts to revisit the old home were always thwarted by a variety of excuses coming from the guardroom, but there were no restrictions on paying a visit to the old and familiar city of Lincoln once again. Busy Broadgate was one of our favourite haunts, for this was where we dined on many Saturday nights in the comfort and warmth of the Naffy Club, before taking just a few short steps up the hill to the Duke of Wellington, and after hurriedly fortifying ourselves with alcohol, made a few less steadier steps down towards the drill hall dance. How well I remember the joy of entering this packed ballroom. Airmen all was to the right, local men to the left, and girls just everywhere. was also a favorite promenade area, where it was easy to meet and converse with Allied American airmen stationed at nearby Waddington, here with their B-29 bombers because of the worsening Berlin crisis.
Whatever shopping we could afford would take place on the high street, civilian clothes being much sought after if you had the clothing coupons to buy them with. And few of us would not have walked up steep hill towards the 900-year-old Lincoln Cathedral, pausing at times to view some of the city's oldest dwelling houses. The Norman Castle of 1068 allows an unspoiled view of the cathedral towers that served as navigational landmarks to many a returning wartime bomber crew. The large nave of the cathedral can accommodate 2,000 souls, whether they come to worship or to enjoy a variety of music festivals. And in the quiet services corner, a chapel dedicated to the RAF is here for the benefit of families wishing to remember relatives lost in two world wars serving on Lincolnshire's airfields. Swindby had begun its role as a basic training school in June 1964, its eight-week training course later being reduced to six. By early 1975, the new Cheshire and Gibson barrack blocks had been added, and 1982 saw the arrival of the first WAF recruits. During this period, the station was shared with a variety of flying and other units. There were aircraft from Cranwell, helicopters of the RAF and the Royal Navy, Harriers from Wittring, and even the Army found use for the camp on occasions. In June 87, the Elementary Flying Training School was accepted as the last flying unit, remaining until July 93, five months before the station finally closed. Also in July 93, Swindeby held its last passing out parade, bringing to an end 53 years of service history. first heard that Arya Swindeby had closed, was about to be sold, and possibly later demolished. I just had to see it again before that unbelievable happened. On this occasion, I would find no one here to turn me away, nor anyone to welcome me either.
coffee room office, where many of us had spent long cold winter days and nights, plus the main charging room area, were now just empty spaces, stripped of all recognizable functions from the past. The electrical section too, once a hive of industry, was empty and silent, as though having forgotten those busier days. And nearby, the old gas treatment station was just as desolate. The guard room, that from memory, was always avoided as much as possible, except for the collection of leave passes and travel warrants. And a visit to the station headquarters was not likely to be connected with any joyous event either. The domestic site was soon to be demolished, so I paid it one last visit before the arrival of the bulldozers, seeing first of all that the Salian canteen hadn't changed one bit on the outside. The inside recalled the night spent here listening to records and drinking tea because of a cash shortage that had kept us on camp, and the Salvation Army staff who ran the establishment including once again Jeff Dubber and his assistants, also managed a mobile canteen that travelled around the sites twice daily. Conveniently close to our quarters, the Emmons Mess and Original Cinema both shared the same entrance. And climbing the stairs, I recall that apart from summer sports, the thrice weekly film shows were the highlights of our life here and I remembered too that each performance began with a short accident prevention feature produced by the Crown Film Unit. On seeing the Emmons mess again, I was reminded of the long queues that sometimes stretched from door to servery, making the meals even more satisfying when we finally got to them. The naffy, which was used mainly in the evenings, provided both additional sustenance and a retail shop outlet, as well as being a convenient center for social gatherings. But the best socializing took place in the dance area, where both the RAF and civilians would meet each fortnight. Seeing these places again was quite nostalgic, but the most moving experience was to revisit my old home after more than 50 years. On entering, I wondered on the present fate of colleagues Cowgill, Howard, Johns, Langdon, Canole, Ray, Wood, Lineker, Palmer and George the Pole, who for ten uninterrupted months had shared this space with me, and the radio that had constantly outputted music from the AFN network in Munich. The few changes in Swindeby village consisted of a more inviting plough-in public house and a completely rebuilt village hall where dances are presumably still held. The old Methodist chapel was used by aviation historian Mike Hodson to display a collection of pictures and historical facts about the old airfield backed by North Kesteven District Council, who additionally manage an airfield trail project that takes enthusiasts on guided visits to what remains of the county's wartime stations. Details of these weekend lecture tours can be obtained from the county offices in Sleaford. The halfway house continues to be frequented by 201 AFS survivors. Okay, 
very clear liquid out the other end. <laughs> Having got it, we didn't know what the bloody hell to do with it. Because none of us ever had got it. Today is reunion day for its 100 or so members who meet each September in these familiar surroundings to exchange reminiscences on days gone by before setting off on visits to a variety of nearby airfield sites under the direction of association organizer Tony Palmer. The air traffic control tower at Swinderby is included in today's itinerary and it's a happy Tony Palmer we see surrounded by his fellow enthusiasts. The popularity of Basingham could well have been attributed to its offer of three public houses. And still to be found in the village are the modernized five bells and bugle horn, though the black swan, always an aria favorite, has long since been converted into a dwelling house with what remains of the old fish and ship shop, now just a reminder of the days past. Only the brickwork of the former Women's Land Army Hostel remains, but still to be found are some of the local girls, without who our station dancers would not have been such a success. In the summer of 1998, the post office became headquarters for the demolition team that in only a few weeks would destroy all eight barrack box and the names appearing on them honoring wartime VCs like 18 year old Scott John Hanna awarded for his Hamden raid on the Antwerp docks. 20 year old flying officer Leslie Manser killed in Anavra, Manchester on the first thousand bomber raid over Cologne. New Zealander, Sergeant James Ward, who climbed onto the wing of a flying Wellington to control an engine fire. Squadron leader Robert Learoyd for a Hamden attack on a viaduct over the Dortmund Ems Canal. South African squadron leader John Nettleton for a daring daylight raid on Augsburg. From Australia, Wing Commander Hugh Edwards, who led a Blenheim sortie on heavily defended Bremen. And finally, Sergeant Thomas Gray and Flying Officer Donald Garland, who flew in the same ferry battle, attacking the Maastricht Bridge. Fifty long years had passed since sharing the Grey Block with my good friend Reg Exon. Here we are, Cliff. What a sorry day to see our premises destroyed, but we spent many, many happy years, or certainly several years, in this surrounding, and we had lots of good fun together. And I'm pleased to see you again after all this time. By Christmas 98, the domestic site had completely gone, leaving the hangar area to be converted into industrial units by the station's new owners, Evans of Leeds. Yes, this was a place, Cliff, the jolly old electrical section. And that, of course, up there was the battery room where you spent so many hours. We did spend a lot of time here together, and we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves at the time. Good memories, lots of good memories. Newark Air Museum provides the final home for both an ex Swindeby vampire and a varsity that replaced the last of the faithful old wimpies. And here too will rest the only Swindeby pillar box from March of 1941. The museum is on the site of the former RAF Winthorpe and is a firm favourite amongst aircraft enthusiasts from across the world whose visits to both the static aircraft display and retail shop will be well rewarded. The final resting place for many of Swindeby's airmen can be found in Thirlby Churchyard, 
perhaps because the airfield lay within its parish boundary. And among the graves we've seen here are those of volunteers from various countries in the Commonwealth who came to our aid during the Second World War. An airfield motorcycle accident just before Christmas 1948 resulted in the loss of Corporal Sheldon and seven wooden crosses stand in remembrance of servicemen's infants. Numbers 300 and 301 Polish squadrons are remembered in Norton Disney Church on three wooden plaques that recall the period they spent giving their support to a common cause. But it is in their own Newark cemetery that we are reminded of the price that the Polish Air Force paid. thousand aircrew were lost from East Kirkby that has since been bought and transformed into the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre by farming brothers Fred and Harold Panton. Amongst the memorabilia is the Gate Guard Lancaster from the 617 Squadron at RAF Scampton. Fred and Harold lost their brother Chris in the air war and it is in his memory that the centre was established. Groombridge, uh, retired RAF squadron leader, um, I taxi the Lancaster here for Fred and Harold Panton and the reason I'm qualified to do it was uh, for 10 years I was one of the Lancaster p display pilots and in fact uh, for the last two years of those 10 I was the officer commanding the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight so I can't fly the Lancaster anymore because I'm retired but it's a great honour and pleasure to come here and at least taxi the final beast around the airfield. Well, we're at East Kirk here with the over the Abro Lancaster Bomber in NX611. We just had two taxi runs today, and the weather's been kind and everything. Everyone seems to have enjoyed themselves. Turning a bit cool now, but uh, it's been dry. Well, we started the museum in 1889, didn't we? Yeah. We bought the Lancaster in uh, 83 and uh, developed a. Then brought it from RF Scampton here in 87 and we have to built the new hangar and we put it in the new hangar and uh, developed the museum from that. And we opened in 1988, didn't we? Yeah, 88. Opened in 1988. So it's 11 years since we opened. And it's, it's come along and been built up from that. It's more or less a memorial to my brother Chris, but it's a memorial to Bomber Command really, not just for my brother, but to all those chaps that flew in the war. 
Uh, there's eight children in our family. There's four boys and four girls, and Chris was the second eldest son, who, like many others, was lost on the Nuremberg grave. He's 19 at the time, so he's very young, of course. Only seems a lad now when you look back, but as I said, there's over 90 bombers went missing that night. One of the worst raids of the war. The former RAF Elvington near York is an almost complete example of a wartime bomber station and has also been converted into an air museum with an emphasis on the Royal Canadian Air Force who are mostly stationed in North Yorkshire. Among the collection of aircraft within the hangar is the only Halifax bomber in existence which along with the Wellington was the principal aircraft used by the Canadians. One of the many volunteer workers here is ex-Swindaby technician Jack Kilvington. Uh, my job in the RAF uh, was an instrument repairer, uh, class one. I, graduated, I went to Melcham to the uh, instrument school there and uh, passed out uh, after I think it was an 18 week course and was posted at Swindaby, a place I'd never heard of. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, I don't know what this is going to be like, but anyway, I arrived at Swinderby, uh, rather liked it, what I saw of it, to start with, and uh, started working on the section uh, the following morning. Um, met, I think, it was a sergeant and a corporal who were both poles, who eventually uh, were dis disappeared back home uh, fairly quickly after I got there, uh, and I was introduced to our uh, flight sergeant, a flight sergeant Dunford, who I think anybody at station at Swindaby in that time will remember, uh, basically because he uh, had a motorbike and sidecar with the biggest Alsatian dog I've ever seen in my life riding in the uh, sidecar. Yes, I enjoyed my time at uh, Swindaby. It was uh, a nice station to be on. Uh, our accommodation was excellent as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and Basically, we were very, very close to where we worked. We didn't have a great deal of far to walk, except, as I say, if you went on the dispersals. But again, I was lucky because usually I managed to drive the instrument section tractor, uh, which we used for towing the trailers about and doing compass swings. Um, the social side of the camp, yes, fairly good. We had a good cricket team. I think uh, I've got a picture somewhere of, at home of the cricket team I played for and when we won the cup, and I can't really for the life in me remember what the cup was, but anyway, we won it. Uh, and uh, we were within striking distance, or walking distance, of course, of the Black Swan Bassingham, and also of the halfway house. Um, we went to the village hall in Swindaby, where we were uh, regularly entertained there. It was quite an entertaining dancing and whatnot down there. Uh, and, uh, of course, we also had our, our on-station naffy, which was the usual naffy, but uh, we also had Sally Ann round the corner uh, and the long walk down to the cinema if we had enough money to go to see the pictures. Uh, when I got demobbed, I started working as a transport manager and uh, uh, carried on in that vein until I retired. And because of my experience with the RAF and the camaraderie that I've met in the RAF, I became involved now with the Yorkshire Air Museum, which is uh, at the end of the uh, old RAF camp of, of Elvington, which uh, is still quite a lot of it left. But we've got about 12 acres of it, and the buildings we have on here are uh, ex-World War uh, II. They, they aren't uh, fabricated, they are ex uh, proper buildings. And of course, uh, I've been involved with the building of the only Halifax in the world, which is in our hangar, uh, and also um, progressing now through to uh, from the Halifaxes and whatnot, right up to rebuilding Buccaneers and whatnot uh, that we have here now. But um, I'm here now on a full-time basis, a volunteer like all the rest of us are here. Uh, we're open seven days a week and I'm here six. And uh, it's a very good place to come. So if any of you are in Yorkshire, please come in and ask for me and I'd be delighted to show you around uh, because uh, it's well worth seeing and it's well worth coming to see. From the 49 operational airfields in Lincolnshire, only three now remain. 
and out of Waddington fly the Boeing AWAC radar sentries. Cranwell is home to the renowned Red Arrows aerobatic flying team that unconsciously acts as the RAF's best recruiting medium when giving demonstrations across the world. And finally, out of Coningsby, comes the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Hurricane, Spitfire and Lancaster, whose sight and sound refresh the memories that even the Swindeby bulldozers cannot completely erase.